thanks very much. Um, so thank you to Tayside and Fife Archaeology Committee for inviting me, and thank you to um, Rachel for finding me confused in the car park this morning and lending me a pound. Right. So um, I'm contractually obliged to say all of these things to you because um, it's in my job description. Um, so yeah, National Trust for Scotland, Scotland's largest conservation charity. Um, we've got an absolutely fascinating portfolio of archaeology sites ranging from you know, the Mesolithic right through to World War II crash sites. And it's my pleasure to get to play with all of these sites. Um, but it's also my pleasure to open them up and invite everybody else to come and play with these sites as well. So that's one of my aims for today. I'm going to talk about um, the House of Dunn then, which is situated uh, at Montrose Basin. Um, it's about three miles from the town of Montrose itself. Um, and it overlooks the basin and looks out towards the harbour at Montrose. Um, as well as the designed estate, the house, um, the place is well worth a visit for Montrose Basin itself. Um, my rangers tell me it's somewhere you can see Atlantic salmon and sea trout coming up the North Sea to lay their eggs upstream, the Angus Glens. And they also tell me that in autumn, last year they counted 80,000 geese migrating through the basin from Iceland and Greenland. How they lined them all up to count them, I've no idea. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of, well, very quickly about the monkey men bashing rocks together on the estate. Uh, but then I'm going to skirt straight past it as well. So, um, so, so as well as there being the historic estate, there is prehistory, um, as we know, sort of Montrose Basin and around Angus, it's absolutely chock-a-block. Specifically at the bit that the National Trust for Scotland looks after, we've got um, Ford House Barrow, which was excavated back in the mid 90s, um, which is a multi-period um, site from the Neolithic right through to the Bronze Age. I know no more about it than that. It's kind of stuck in some kind of publication limbo, which is, is sort of slightly beyond me. Uh, the other site is uh, Gallows No, which is the Bronze Age burial mound, which sits directly in front of the house. We had a, um, a student from Germany came over and did a study of that a few years ago, um, which was, again, was really interesting. Um, recently as well, we've been lucky enough to commission AOC to do some geophysical work at three crop mark uh, sites in the, the farmed land just outside the designed estate. Um, and they carried out this geophysics and it was really interesting for us because it, what we found in at least one parcel of land, the scheduled site which shows up as a crop mark doesn't show up at all in geophysics, which might suggest that it's actually on its last legs. So, you know, is there an excuse for gaining and, and excavating that, arguably? Um, and the other site actually showed up that the vast majority of the features are outside the scheduled area um, that, you can, that you can't see as a crop mark, not a surprise. Um, but I found out recently we've actually just sold that land, so we'll ignore that. Um, <laughs> it's not to, not to do with me anymore. Um, so the main attraction is the house um, and the estate itself, which is owned by the Erskine, or was owned by the Erskine family from about 1360 right through to 1980 when, uh, when the trust took responsibility. I think in 1980 it was a hotel at the time, um, which I would, I've not actually seen any photographs or anything, but I imagine it would be quite an exciting kind of, like a Bates Motel or something out of The Shining. The Trust spent a lot of time and effort actually reconstructing the original um, sort of interiors of the house. Um, and it was originally, the house itself was originally commissioned by David Erskine, the 13th layer of Dunn, and commissioned it in 1732. Um, and it was completed in 1742, um, and it was a William Adam design. Now, I'm, I'm again told by our architects that it's, um, it's what, what, would the, what would the phrase be? It's, it's, it's kind of, it's a medium sized Adam house. It's not a big grand house, apparently. It's a lot bigger than my one bedroom flat, but it's, uh, it's certainly not a grand house. Um, but as well as being designed by William Adam, it was also tinkered with by John Erskine, the Earl of Mar. And if any of you know Alloa Tower, and the absolutely fantastic estate design that he, he put together for, for um, Alloa. Um, so there's some of his influence involved in, in the house as well. It's renowned for its interiors, um, particularly the Joseph Enzer um, plaster work. And again, this plaster work is specifically designed um, to represent David Erskine, um, who was a high court judge. So on the one hand, you've got depictions of um, the Mars, the Roman god of war. And on the other, you've got Minerva, the goddess of wisdom and peace. So he could be a rough, you know, hang him kind of judge when he wanted, and he could be, you know, very mild and very understanding as well. 
the house itself sits within um, the designed estate. It's the classic 18th, 19th century design landscape, and it has all the accoutrements that you'd expect from those kind of landscape, um, ice house, water garden. Um, but the bit we're going to concentrate on is over here, which is the walled kitchen garden and burial ground. Why are we looking at that? Well, if we look at some old maps, which are always nice. Um, looking back through the mapping evidence, sorry, I was expecting to move around a little bit. So <laughs> um, over here at the top, um, you can see the top map, Roy's military map from 1747, 1755. And again, it's fairly standard cartography. It shows the house and it shows the land ownership around it. Below that, you can see the John Knox map from um, 1850. And things have changed slightly there. If I remember rightly, there's a chapel marked on that one just on the other side of the burn. If we flick forward a little bit further and zoom in at that point, you'll see quite interestingly, there's a site marked Duncastle site of and another one of church or chapel. So the top map there is the um, first edition 1865 and the bottom one is the 1903 church in ruins and castle site of. There's also a historic reference to a castle of Dun being sacked um, in 1644 by the troops of Charles I. So that piques my interest. It's like, where is this supposed castle of Dun? And how can we sort of share the investigation of that with um, sort of visitors? Um, if you take a look again, this is the aerial view. So the bit that, that we're interested in, oh, hello. Oh no. So the bit we're interested in is this bit here, which as far as the visitor experience to the, to the house of Dunnies concerned, is completely disused. So the kitchen garden is completely empty. It's just a bit of grass and we do absolutely nothing with it. So from my point of view, it was fair game. So we've got the map clue. We've got chapel and we've got castle marked on the map. What other clues have we got? Well, on the ground, we've got this archway just in here. And in these other photographs, you can see just how it is just an open walled garden with absolutely no other features showing. Um, now, this archway was originally described by Jervis in 1861 as being early 16th century. Then in 1978, um, the Royal Commission got involved and looked at it and said, no, 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 it's not. It's post 16th century. So that's useful as well. What the orientation of the arch does actually show us is an inside and an outside. So we don't actually know which way it goes on either side, whether there's any walls or anything associated with it at this stage. But we do know that that photograph is taken from the inside of whatever that gate is enclosing. The inside of that is the wall garden. Now, all the field work that we did here, all the excavation is part of the National Trust for Scotland's, um, call it a thistle camp scheme or a trailblazer. And the trailblazer is um, a working holiday scheme for young people to come and get involved in archaeology and heritage. And the idea is that we're trying to foster an interest in heritage and archaeology um, and send that on into future generations and create advocates for the kind of work that we're all interested in for when they turn into adults and they start to support that work in, in various different ways. And it's something that we've worked on for quite a few years, because let's be honest, if we look around this room, you know, we are missing quite a few of the younger generation. So we're wanting to get people excited by archaeology and by the potential for that discovery. So this is all the work we've done, apart from that that we've been, that's commissioned, has been done by young people. So the first thing we did was commission a piece of work, and we commissioned a geophysical survey by um, Rose Geophysics, who were brilliant enough to do it in December, um, which is very good of them. Um, and what did they show up? Well, here's the geophysics plot. So the top area there is the wall garden itself. Is this wall garden here? Um, Again, if I can orientate myself. That is the archway just there, right? Interpretation for that geophysics, not a huge amount, frankly. Um, so again, we've got the archway and then we've got an anomaly coming off the archway, showing up that way. And then we've got this big goodle of stuff in the middle. This big goodle of stuff in the middle is a tree in a rabbit burrow. So we unleashed the young people. And what did we find? Well, um, 
we focused first of all on where we obviously had that clear anomaly and we had the archway itself. Um, yes, indeed, we did find that that archway, oh, I've done it again, sorry, that archway was connected to an enclosing wall. Maybe not too surprising. But what we did find, hang on, let me find now because we had dateable pottery from this. All right. <coughs> We had dun, 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 five shirts of medieval white gritty wear, which for a group of young people is really exciting. They were very pleased to have found something. And this, and the layers, the, the wall itself that was sitting within this ditch was sealed by um, a 17th century layer dated from a clay pipe fragment. So again, not absolutely jam packed with stuff, but just enough on a small kit scale four day excavation to give us something to work with. The following year, we did another excavation and we learned a few things on this one as well. We learned that when myself and Derek Alexander get given shovels, we get very excited and we like getting out of the office. So me and Derek posed for photographs. And we also found that at this time of year, there was very little else going on in Angus and that the newspapers were absolutely fascinated by our ditch. So, so we found a second ditch in the, in the walled garden as well. Um, the second much, much larger ditch, we dated that from, um, again, some medieval white gritty ware sitting within the fill of the ditch. But this time, this was actually um, um, sealed with a 15th, 16th century lair which contained uh, Rhenish stoneware. So again, this was, this was uh, another quite nice sort of sealed context. So, interpretation-wise, we have the archway there with a wall coming across this way. Then we have an earlier ditch running across here. And as you can see, absolutely no sign of that earlier ditch on the geophysics whatsoever. So we're now looking again at the geophysical data to see if we can um, sort of find that ditch on there now that we know that we've got relative depths and things like that. Um, next, we're gonna jump down to this area at the bottom here which is the graveyard associated with the estate. And that graveyard contains a mausoleum. Now, we were lucky enough, again, we commissioned uh, North Light Heritage to do some um, research and some building survey for us for this mausoleum. And um, an RIP North Light Heritage, it's a shame. They've gone, they did a fantastic piece of work. And it's one of the only pieces of work I've ever done with them that didn't involve interpretive dance or music. They were very artistic in their approach. So had they got away with to do what they wanted to do, this talk would have been very different. Um, but the mausoleum itself um, actually does contain human remains. Um, it contains human remains of six coffins. Three of them are identified as Margaret and Archibald Erskine, who died in 1848-1846. And then a younger Margaret Erskine, who died in 1881, aged 23 months. Um, there's two more adult coffins and one more child coffin in there as well, which are unidentified at the moment. And there are two stone plaques and one of them, which is the Erskine family crest, and is dated to 1702. <clears throat> Again, if we jump to the geophysics of that area, what you can see from here is the white area in the middle is the standing building, and everything around it is geophysics results. So if you jump down to the interpretation here, you can see the footprint sitting underneath that building is almost twice as large. So we knew straight away that this, this um, mausoleum was, was standing on something earlier. And when you think about that map reference earlier on, showing chapel ruins of, castle site of, this was all starting to fit that story. So the building survey that was done by um, North Light Heritage identified a few features which showed up as, as two blocked doorways or windows and the the building itself had been um, seriously rebuilt. Um, that roof, had, the, the roof gable had been added and the, whatever original roof was stood on there was actually inverted to what we call a butterfly roof. And the reason for us doing the work in the first place was the whole thing was leaking. Um, and the trust made quite a bold decision on this because the graveyard is managed by the local council and the mausoleum is actually still owned by the Erskine family. Um, but the trust took the decision that if we didn't repair this, then nobody would. Um, and it was an integral part of the estate, so, so we went ahead with this kind of work. Um, as well as identifying, as I say, where there's blocked openings and where the walls have been slightly raised, so we know there's at least more than one phase, the historic research also showed... Um, 
what we have is a description in uh, 1791 of, um, of the mausoleum, and it actually refers to Dunn Church. It says, it appears anciently to have been the chapel belonging to the family of Dunn, the mansion house of the family having been built very near to the churchyard. The church is in good repair, has two lofts, one to the east, the other to the west, and the east end of the church is styled the choir and has a fount on the wall intended of old for baptism. Um, the Dunkirk Sessions um, records also record this building um, as being the Church of Dun, sometime from sometime in the 1300s, and dedicated to the Virgin Mary. Looking back at the family history as well, the fifth laird, John Erskine, um, was a big player in the Reformation. And there's even um, reference and record of John Knox reputedly having preached in a chapel um, on the estate of Dun. Um, so as well as doing the standing building recording, we also had to strip around the church itself and have a look at these vaulted cellars that were in there. And what we found um, below ground was actually we had these two projecting walls on either side of that mausoleum, um, which again made us reassess what the footprint was and actually what the building phases were. And what we found when comparing it to other places is that actually it follows what is a 19th century tradition of taking these old um, medieval chapels and refashioning them into these Gothic family um, mausoleum, mausolea, I'm not sure. Um, so a couple of the examples that were found um, as comparison is the Tully Buddy Old Church, um, which is the bottom left one there, which actually fits the footprint exactly as well. So it's exactly the same dimensions as the geophysical results that we got at the House of Dunn. Um, and according to Richard Fawcett, the mausoleum of the Keith family at Overton in Fife is probably formed from the remains of the Tully Allen Parish Church as well, and that's bottom right. And at Kilbride Parish Church, Perthshire, that has a mausoleum of similar design and date as House of Dunn. And again, it's been suggested that this might sit upon the footprint of the 12th century predecessor. So again, this kind of fashion of, of, of reusing these buildings and refashioning them seems to make sense. And that again seems to fit with this mapping evidence that, that we have at Dunn. Um, but I still haven't found the castle or this tower house or whatever it was they were living in during the medieval period, um, which was marked on the map. So once again, I called in my minions and the young people came along to try and get involved in the excavation. And what did we find? Well, in good archaeological fashion, we found a series of small walls we actually found a series of quite substantial, quite well-constructed, quite brilliantly preserved walls. Um, you can see a right angle corner there. You can see another one there. We've got a, a nice curve there. And again, we've got a right angle turn there. And these are actually positioned equidistant between the um, 19th century mausoleum and the 20th century um, family grave plot as well. So again, they're maintaining this, this family association with this area of the estate, and, and specifically keeping that lineage with the, with the 1300s. Um, yeah, and that's as far as we got, to be honest. Yeah, there we go. Um, so as I say, what we wanted to do, each one of those pieces of work was one week per year over a, since 2013. So the things that we look after at the National Trust for Scotland aren't going anywhere. So we're not really in any rush to do any of this work, but it is, it's really important that we keep these things ticking over. We're hoping now, as I say, all of these remains are really well consolidated. They're not in any way particularly sensitive when it comes to excavating them. What we would like to do is um, open this site up um, as a more permanent kind of visitor attraction, but also keep developing the story year on year. Um, to, to bring young people to the estate, to keep giving this excavation opportunity and to keep building the story for repeat visits. Thank you very much.